All right, so today, today I want to preach on um, improving your marriage and obviously you can apply these principles to any relationship, but specifically I just want to talk about marriage because I think um, obviously the family is very important. Um, and I preached on these tips a few uh, years ago, many years ago when I first started the church. So I just thought I wanted to sort of break them down, make them a bit more brief and share them with you today, just as a reminder in your marriage that you definitely want to uh, take these on board. Uh, I find even in my own marriage, like taking these uh, certain tips to heart, I think has really strengthened my marriage with Elizabeth and given us a really um, strong foundation on which to, to build our marriage and our relationship. So just a couple of tips on marriage, but the title of the sermon is improving your marriage. And even for people that aren't married yet, these are some things you wanna think about, right? Because this is sort of what you're aiming for when you start dating and whatnot. So first thing I want to say is when it comes to having a good uh, God glorifying marriage is we want to have the right perspective because oftentimes just with a lot of things to do with Christianity, we come in with preconceived ideas, traditions that have been passed down from our family, things we've learned from mom, from dad, from grandma, from, from friends and family. And oftentimes a lot of the things we learn from the world and from our friends and family are not necessarily biblical. Right? We might have seen just things that we've been taught, maybe even the example. You know, you may not have come from a Christian family. You might not have come from a family. You know, I come from a broken family. Like if I just, you know, carried on, oh, this is how my mom did things. This is how my dad did things. And hey, maybe I'll end up with the same result, right? And have a, have a broken marriage. So we want to renew our mind. And that's the first thing I just want to talk about at the beginning. The Bible says here in Ephesians 4.23, uh, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and then it goes on to say talk and that you put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness uh, romans 12 1 and 2 is a very famous passage too talking about us being transformed i beseech you therefore uh, brethren by the mercies of god so i beseech is to to plead with somebody right to ask them to do something but more earnestly i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, right? So it's talking about service to God. Verse number two says here, and be not conformed to this world. So don't be in the same way, right, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the way we start to change the way we act, the way we behave, the way we go about our day to day, is it first starts in the mind, right? We have to renew our mind, get our mind back into how God wants us to do things, and then that'll change in the way we behave. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we've got to get back to a biblical view on everything. And it's the same with our marriage. And like I said, we, we've learned a lot of things from our parents maybe, or we've learned a lot of things from the world. Maybe you learned a lot of things from movies and songs and you don't even realize, you know, that you've been watching like maybe this sitcom and whatnot and that sort of philosophy starts creeping in to your expectations into what you think how a marriage should be or how a relationship should be rather than getting back to the Bible to see, hey, what does God expect from a relationship? What does he want a relationship to be like? So, you know, if you come from a family where it's, it's not the way the Bible should be, and we'll go into those sorts of things, but say you come from a family, like I said, it's a broken family where there wasn't good communication, that they were keeping things from each other. Or you come from a family where mom was really dominating and dad was really passive. We need to get these ideas out of our mind, right? And get back to, hey, well, how does God want me to be? Not just, hey, well, my parents were like that and I'm just gonna continue to be like, you know, my mom controlled everything. It was really dominating and always talking over my father, always correcting my father, always telling him he's an idiot, always making him look stupid. You don't want to be, you want to continue that, right? If that's the sort of mom you had. Same with dad. If dad was just like never involved, you know, didn't care about things. He was just like always at work all the time, never spending time with the kids, that sort of thing. You know, never helping mom around the house, right? Because he was too much of a man. That's the sort of thing we need to get away from and get back to uh, what God expects of us as a, as a husband or as a wife. So we want to renew our mind. We want to have the right um, perspective on love as well, right? So we'll look at a couple of verses on that to change our perspective. We talk about renewing our mind. Uh, if we go to 2 John uh, 1 verse 4, uh, it talks about here, you know, what, what is love, right? He says here, Now I beseech thee, lady, uh, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another, 
And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So one thing we need to know as well that any relationship we have in our marriage as well, that it's all about God, isn't it? God comes first. You can't have a loving relationship when you're disobeying God at the same time. You need to obey God's commandment. You know, you need to be in church. You need to be reading your Bible, praying, going soul winning, keeping the commandments of God, trying to walk in the spirit because you can't love your spouse. You can't be a loving partner if you're disobeying God at the same time. So your marriage first and foremost is about God. Everything we do, you know, whether you eat or whether you drink, you know, do all to the glory of God. So we know that whatever we do, it's for God. And marriage is no different because oftentimes people get so caught up in relationships that their partner or their spouse or the person they're dating or even their husband or wife sometimes becomes an idol where everything is just about them. And sometimes it's the same with our family where people just, they serve their children, they worship their children almost to the point where their life is all about their children. It's all about their spouse. And then God starts getting neglected, right? How many times do you hear people say, oh, I can't go to church because I've got family things on. Or I've got, you know, my kids have to do this. I got to take them here and take them there. I don't have time for God. I don't have time to go soul winning. Whereas you don't realize, you know, you're not loving your family if you're disobeying God. You're not doing the things that God wants you to do because you're not being a good example, right? You're not showing them, you're not teaching them priorities and showing, hey, God comes first and then we fit family obligations and things that the children need to do around God's schedule. We need to make sure that we are doing what God wants us to do because ultimately that's what our marriage is for. You know, why, why did we get married to somebody? It's to serve God to a greater degree. You know, why do we have children? It's to teach them to serve God to a greater degree. That's the whole idea. So if having a spouse having children takes you away from the things of God, then obviously you've got the wrong perspective on why it even exists, why it's even there. So we need to have the right idea of love. Love is about obeying God because even our relationship, it's about um, obeying God. That's, that's, that's who we are serving. Um, but also, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, where we read, this is a, a famous passage about charity. It's about love. And when we read here in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So you'll notice here that charity is about action, isn't it? You know, there's not really much here about how you feel. It's like charity just feels really nice, right? No, chari charity is about doing things, right? It's about doing things for other people. It's an action. It's not just an emotion. Now, is love an emotion as well? Yes, but it's not just an emotion. And we don't want to get sucked into, uh, you know, this Hollywood kind of fairy tale expectations where it's always about how we feel. Sometimes people have their Christianity like that, where they struggle with Christianity and they struggle to keep the commandments of God because they're just like, I just don't have this, this love and this burning desire. And, and, you know, because at the beginning when they were saved, everything's exciting and everything's new. And they're sort of uh, springboarding off that energy to serve God. But then after a while, that excitement goes away, right? Because now they realize, hey, serving God is actually hard work. You know, so serving God isn't always, you know, just a bed of roses. It's actually hard work. It's study. It's prayer. It's reading your Bible. It's going out into the highways and hedges, compelling the, them to come in. And this is not always fun, right? But then you get to a point where you realize you do it because you love God, because love is not just the feeling, right? Love is also the action. It's, it's the commitment to, to serve somebody. It's the same in our marriage, right? Sometimes, some, hey, does that mean a marriage can't have emotions? No, of course, there's ups and downs, but we should always be loving our spouse because charity, it's, a, it's an action. It's, a, it's not just an emotion, right? So we don't want to be driven by our emotions. We want to be driven by the Word of God. Um, uh, you know, uh, love is, like I said, it's service. It's action, and, and, and we see that in the Bible. You know, God commended his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we see a God shows 
his love to us. And when we think about our marriage, we want to realize the commitment that we've made. You know, when we spoke our vows at, the, at, at our marriage ceremony, um, you know, we promise, you know, from, from, for better, for worse, till death do us part. So if you think about the vows that we speak when we, when we marry somebody, um, really it's a, it's a promise to serve, isn't it? It's a promise to be faithful to that person. And, you know, one thing you need to think about is, you know, marriage, marriage is not 50, it's not always 50-50. Like ideally in a marriage, you know, you have two people that have the right frame of mind, both doing the right thing, and, and that's the ideal scenario. But what you have to realize in a marriage is sometimes marriage is not always 50-50. Sometimes marriage is 100-0, right? Where you're not getting anything back from your spouse. But does that, does that justify you? Because some people, when their spouse isn't treating them right, they think, oh, marriage is 50-50 because they're not treating me right. Like, I, you know, I'm just not treating them right because they don't deserve it. But that's not how marriage should be, right? That's not how God was. You know, even God, God says, for God, you know, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ showed his love even when we were enemies, right? He came for us. He died for us. Um, he showed us his love. And that's the sort of love we ought to have where, you know, sometimes marriage isn't 50-50. And if you have the frame of mind where marriage is 50-50, your marriage is not as good as it could be, right? We're talking about improving your marriage, right? I'm not saying you may necessarily have a bad marriage right now, but we want to improve our marriage and get to the point where it's, it's better than it could be. And if you have the mindset where it always has to be 50-50, then there are some things that you're not doing in your marriage that you could be. Whereas if you think of your marriage as, hey, I should be giving it 100% because ultimately I'm serving God. God's commanded me to be a good husband or a good wife. I ought to obey God uh, even if my spouse is not obeying God or is not reciprocating. Um, and this is especially important once children are involved because when people start thinking marriage is only 50-50, um, you know, then there's unresolved strife and all sorts of things. So we want to have, we want to renew our mind, right? Get back to the Bible. Um, you know, we want to have the correct perspective on love. Uh, and what I really want to focus on today, and I'll just, and we'll go through four examples, is that um, to improve your marriage, you really need to have the frame of mind that marriage is about service and sacrifice. You know, it's not about somebody serving you. And oftentimes when you know, people are dating or they're looking for a spouse, how many times do you hear them say things like, I wonder if this person is right for me? And they're asking that question because they're thinking, is this person going to fulfill my needs? Is this person going to make me happy? Is this it's all me, 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 right? And this is how people go about dating. Where really in a relationship, if you want a successful, good marriage and you want to improve your relationship, you need to have the frame of mind that it's not just about receiving it's about service and it's it's like this in any type of the christian life right even in church if you come to church and it's all about me me me, what does the church do for me well when it stops doing that for you you go right but then when you come to church and you think well where can i serve how can i be a blessing right how can i how can i get involved and do something for other people do something for god that's the sort of mindset we ought to have in everything that we do is how can we make a difference the focus is on us not in the sense of what can people do for me, but what am I able to do? How am I going to use the talents that God gave me to serve other people? Let's go to Galatians 5.13, where it says here, um, for brethren, um, is that the right one? For, Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have not been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, that's right, but by love serve one another. So that's what we want to do. We want to serve one another and have that mindset. So what are some practical ways when we think about our marriage, our relationship, is that we serve one another? Well, a couple of things that I have written down here is, uh, one is, you know, you put them first. You know, you put their choices first, their preferences first. I mean, you know, you know, sometimes you want to give them the opportunity to choose. Like, let's say you're going out to eat or something. You know, it's like giving them the option of where they would like to go. Um, you know, in my family, I mean, my family's really simple, so I don't really have, like, really, uh, you know, uh, like, nice, exciting things to tell you guys about, about the things we do. But it might be something as simple as, you know, if you know that they like a certain flavor of food or a certain piece of food, that like you give it to them. Right? I mean, some people, for example, you might be eating like some pork crackle or something, right? And then everyone wants to eat the, the crackle on the pork and you know there's not much. You might want to give that to your spouse and do something nice for them, um, even though you may want to eat it, 
right? You, you let them choose first. Uh, maybe it's a restaurant activity. If you have a day off, you know, what, you, what are you going to do? You might want to let them choose. You know, you want to take joy in pleasing your spouse, right? And seeing them happy. You know, rather than just thinking that they're there just to serve you, think about, hey, how can you serve them? Make them happy. Do something for them, right? It's better, you know, if, if you have a situation and um, it's much better to be fighting over who gets to serve the other person, right? Than it is fighting over, you know, who gets something. You know, it's kind of like when you're paying the check, you know, at a restaurant or something. Isn't it better to fight over who's going to pay the check rather than fighting over, you know, you, know, you paid it last time, you should pay it this time? That sort of, that's, a, that's what I'm getting at. But also, you know, because marriage is about service, you know, relationships are about service, you don't want to refuse a blessing too. Let's say your spouse wants to do something nice for you, let them do it. You know, because some people have a bit of a false piety where it's like, oh, you know, I, I don't deserve this, don't do this for me and things like that. But you're robbing that person of a blessing because, you know, if they want to do something nice for you and you never receive any blessing from them, from them, that as well can be a hindrance to how good your relationship can be because then they, 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 you're like discouraging them from doing something nice for you if you don't want to receive um, some, a blessing that they want to give you. Now, as I go into these uh, other four examples in the Bible of just uh, uh, different roles of husband and wife and whatnot, um, what I really want to focus on in terms of improving your marriage and, and on this point of service is really what, what I want you to think about is what you can do different and not what your spouse is not doing. Because right? oftentimes when we think about what the right thing to do is, our mindset is, oh yeah, well if they just did the right thing, our marriage would be so much better. You know, it's, it's like any relationship. And I know I'm sort of uh, explaining it in marriage. But any relationship's the same. I mean, it's, it's you know, the focus, pe people generally tend to go, if there's a problem in a relationship, they will say, you know, if, if they just did that, if they just did this differently, oh, it'd be so much easier. And, and, and maybe you're right. You know, I'm not saying that generally that's not, that, 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 that isn't the reason, but you can't control other people. You can't control how that person reacts, what that person says, what they do. But what you can control is your own actions. And what you need to learn as well is if you actually do what's right by God in your own life, you'll actually have more of an influence and more of an encouragement in that person doing the right thing. Whereas if you're just sitting back just going, well, that person should do this, that person should do that, well, nothing's going to change, is it? Because you can't change other people. So you need to look at yourself. You know, I've seen people complain about their spouse not serving God. But then it's like, but well, are you serving God? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you want your spouse to be passionate about the things of God? Are you passionate about the things of God? You know, if I want my wife to be passionate about the things of God, I can't say to my wife, yeah, you don't read your Bible. You don't talk about God. You don't go soul winning. And it's like, I don't do it either. Do you know what I mean? Is that, is that a reasonable expectation in my marriage? If I'm complaining about something my wife doesn't do and I don't do it either? So when you focus on what you can do different, you need to ask yourself, you know, how, how do I be the best partner to them? How, how, what can I do different? Um, because it's always simpler to just put the onus on the other person, right? It's always simpler to just say, well, they just did this, everything would be fixed, rather than looking at yourself and say, hey, you know what, what, what can I do differently? Could I have asked differently? Could I have said something differently? Could I be a better example? You know, could I have, you know, maybe have cultivated a better relationship along the way and therefore we can communicate better? You know, so, you know, people just look at the now and they say, oh, you know, she doesn't want to talk. But, you know, th things like that don't just happen in a day. You know, sometimes it's building up over time, you know, having bad communication, a bad relationship. And this is why now um, you've got to make up for lost ground. Right, you've got to make up for lost ground. So let's look at four examples uh, in the Bible of just different things. And, and as we go through these, that's, that's the focus I really want to look at today is just, you know, when, you, when we go to these passages, you don't want to think about, hey, if only that person did that better. You want to think about, hey, how can I follow God better and hopefully have a good influence on my uh, significant other? Uh, so let's go to Ephesians first. So we'll just start at, you know, the the most obvious passage about the role of husbands and wife. We'll read through it and I'll just give a few thoughts. 
But this is Ephesians 5, 22. And this really, I mean, this passage is one where it really renews a Christian's mind because this is so countercultural in terms of how the family should be. And, you know, like today, everyone talks about, you know, husband and wife being equal. Why doesn't the wife go out and work and all these sorts of things? And I'm not going to go into all the reasons why God has it the way he does. But ultimately, we just need to trust that God knows what he's doing. You know, he's designed the man. He's designed the woman. He knows what our strengths and weaknesses are. He knows what benefits society as a whole and what example we are to set and the image that the God, uh, that, that the family is meant to have to society, that we ought to take heed to what God tells us uh, uh, a husband and wife's role should be. So verse 22 in Ephesians 5, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, you know, this is a hard passage for, for, for women to really take on board and to practice because sometimes your husband is not worth submitting to, right? In the sense that, you know, you, you want to follow this, you want to submit to your husband, but he's not always somebody that's easy to submit to. You know, you think, oh, he's, he's not a very strong leader or he's, he's lazy and whatnot, or, you know, he's, and that sort of thing. And you might complain about these things. But like I said at the beginning of this sermon is... The focus is not on what he can do better, right? When you look at the commandments of God, the focus is, is how can you be a more submissive wife? Maybe there are things that you can submit to that you don't need to complain about and nag about. And then, you know, uh, you might have a good influence on him because maybe, you know, he's looking at, you know, maybe if people that are married to like a, a believer and, and, and the Bible does talk about this. In the sense that if, if a Christian wife is married to an unbeliever and she's just nagging him all the time and things like that, you can actually put him off Christianity, right? So maybe instead of saying, oh, I just wish my husband, you know, because this is, this is how women will talk, right? I just wish my husband was somebody that was more respectable, somebody easier to lead and all these things. He didn't make such bad decisions. And this is the mentality. I'm not saying that he's making all the right decisions, right? I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I'm just saying, like, you know, maybe he isn't. It's not, not justifying um, a, a, a husband's actions. But what I'm saying is, from your point of view, right, because we're all thinking about what we can do better, is how can you be a more submissive wife? How can you obey your husband in areas and, and not make it so hard for him to lead? Because, you know, oftentimes, if you are a submissive wife, that can often get your husband to step up. Right? So rather than you making all the decisions and taking control and always shutting him down, always correcting him every time he's wrong, you know, just trying to get behind him, support him, be the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. You know, when he asks you to do something, you do it with joy. Right? Like imagine the change would be, he'd be like so shocked and, you know, I don't know. I don't know what effect it might have on different men, right? But, you know, uh, you know, but I know like some men, if their wife was more respectable and more submissive, that might make them step up, right? Because it might make them feel a bit more of a man. And, and you are having that effect on him, not by leading him, but actually submitting to him. And when you do that, you want to do it with joy. You know, don't, don't have this mentality. It's like, well, I do it because I have to do it because God commanded me to do it. You know, if you can do it with joy, this is how you can improve your marriage. Right? Like I said, you can't necessarily control what other people do, but you can influence them. So when you think about from a woman's point of view, hey, how can I improve my marriage? Well, how well are you obeying this command? How, if you do it to a greater degree, you're going to improve your marriage more. Now for men, it says here, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So think about, you know, when it talks to the husbands, you know, what does he have in mind? I mean, he's got, you know, Jesus has the church in mind. We ought to have our wife in mind, how we can please our wife, how we can help her to improve, how we can grow her. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now, I think we ought to internalize that because oftentimes, you know, as men, you know, maybe we've got the money, right? We make the decisions and it's so easy to, to spend the money, make decisions for things that you like. But the question is, are you thinking about your wife when you make decisions in the family? Are you thinking about your wife when you spend money and make different decisions? 
And oftentimes, you know, men will treat themselves better than their wife. They'll buy themselves nice gadgets, but then they complain when their wife buys something, you know, and things like that. So it's all about here just, you know, if you really love your wife, you'll treat her like you treat her. You know, sometimes you want time with the mates. Hey, she wants want time with her mates too, you know. Just, do you allow her to have that time? Sometimes you want to go out and have fun, but then sometimes she wants to go out and have a good time as well, you know, with her friends and whatnot. So treat your wife how you would want to be treated and, and you don't want to be selfish, right? So oftentimes, I'm not going into the deck because I want to cover a few other points, but my point is whenever passages like this are preached in churches, how often are people just saying, oh, I wish my husband would just, you know, yeah, you know, I want my husband to listen to this. He needs to love his wife as he loves himself. Or, you know, a wife will go, oh, uh, it was a husband would go, oh, yeah, my wife needs to hear this. She needs to submit. And this is what I want your focus to change. If you want to have a good marriage, you need to change that focus and stop thinking about what your spouse can do better as opposed to what you can do better, right? And if your focus is on what you can do better, how you can be a better Christian, I guarantee you, you will have a positive influence on your wife and your, your, your marriage will improve. So that's uh, just the role within the family, right? Let's go on to the second one. We'll go to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. And this is your, your duty in the bedroom, right? I won't talk about this one too long, but this is, this is very important in marriage, right? Is our duty in the bedroom, our physical intimacy with our husband or our wife. It says here in 1 Corinthians 7, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So that's not just saying just handshakes and things like that, because in verse 2 it explains, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So the reason why we are married and we have this obligation, as it's going to go into in 1 Corinthians 7, to service one another right in the bedroom, right? It's, it's to avoid fornication. Now, admittedly, this is an issue that is harder for men than is for women. Right? I mean, any man can testify to that, right? To say, hey, this is something that men struggle with more than women. But for women, when you read this, right, you need to take on board that this is a responsibility you have as a woman, right? That you are helping your husband to avoid fornication, to avoid unclean thoughts, to avoid looking at pornography and struggling with the desire that he has that is obviously normally stronger than a woman's. Rather than having this idea of, oh, you know, my husband just, you know, he just wants to do this, you know, he doesn't care about me and things like that. Um, you know, and he's always, you, you know, you, refu you using it as like a bait to get him to do things for you or just refusing to do it just because you want to be difficult. You know, this, this sort of attitude from women and from wives is so ungodly because you don't understand the responsibility you have as a wife to help your husband with this struggle. Right? And rather than, you know, your husband sharing a struggle with you and you just write him off as some like pervert or something, you know, he's a sex crazed guy. And it's just like, hey, this is just how a lot of guys are. I mean, just, just deal, just <laughs> like learn the reality of it, right? That men are wired that way and you have a responsibility to help him with that struggle. This is why marriage exists, right? Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other. See, if you refrain, you're defrauding your husband or your wife from something that is rightfully theirs. And you'll notice here that in marriage, right, when we looked at Ephesians 5, there's a hierarchy that the husband is in charge and the wife submits. But here, it's, it's equal. Isn't that interesting that the husband has power over his wife's body, but the wife has power over the husband's body? Why? Because this is something that is so important that God doesn't want us to struggle with fornication, that this is the responsibility that a husband and wife have uh, in the family, in, in their marriage. Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So remember this sermon tonight, it's focusing on, hey, what you can do better. We talked about your role in the family, but now when it comes to your duty in the bedroom, women ought to take on board and say, hey, how can I help my husband, you know, not struggle with fornication, fornication thoughts, pornography and whatnot. 
but men as well. You know, when you think about this, you know, oftentimes when you read a passage like this to teenage boys, they kind of get a grin on their face, right? Because they're kind of like, oh, you know, now they got, you know, a little sex slave. They, they can, this is what they kind of think of this. But this is absolutely not what God is getting at, right? Because remember, what God is about is about service, right? So when you read a passage like this, it's not like, ah, now I can just command my wife. And, you know, it's like with a submission, right? So I just command my wife, just do whatever. That's, that's the wrong frame of mind. That's not why that is there, right? So the whole idea of her submitting to you is that you can protect her and lead the family, right, to serve God, right? That's why we have authority. It's the same with here. The here, here is with, it, it's a service one to another. So just like women have that responsibility, men have that responsibility too. And believe it or not, you know, you can have a self-centered, selfish attitude in the bedroom. And if you want to improve your marriage, you ought not have this sort of attitude, right? In terms of, and you know, I'm not going to go into graphic detail, obviously, but you know, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? For those of you who are married, you can, you can have a selfish attitude in the bedroom. And if you want to improve your marriage, improve your physical intimacy, just like in service one to another in what you do for one another, the bedroom is no different, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, you're happy, right? That both parties are happy because if you're just um, selfish about it, you know, your wife is not going to be enjoying her time in the bedroom with you as much as she could. Um, and that's going to have an impact on your relationship because the Bible talks very highly of, you know, the bedroom and the reason why husband and wife are together. That if you're struggling in that area with your husband and wife, this is just another way where you have to think about it. How can I improve? How can I be better at, you know, making my wife enjoy the time in the bedroom? And then likewise, you know, with the wife. Let's go on to another point. So you've got your role within the family. Uh, you've got your, your duty uh, in the bedroom. Uh, let's talk about communication now. Communication. So Amos 3.3. And I know sometimes it's awkward to talk about these things, you know, because in our day and age, you know, th these things just go don't get preached about right? You don't, th these things don't get preached about in church. And that's why when people turn to these passages, sometimes people are a little bit awkward. But that's the problem, right? Because people aren't preaching about these things that, that uh, people don't uh, know what is expected of them from the Word of God. All right, Amos 3.3, 3, it says here, can two walk together except they be agreed? So my third point here is our communication with each other. And when I, whenever I think about being unified in thought, um, this, this passage always comes to my mind because how can two people walk together in unity if they don't even agree on things? And it's the same in church, right? And church is the same. Um, and that's why, you know, obviously you guys know some people uh, have left our church, but, you know, it's fine because, you know, if, if we want to have a unified church here, we want to be in unity. So if people don't agree with the things that we do here or the things that I believe, then, you know, it's probably better they're somewhere where they do agree, right? So that they're in unity with that church if they're not in unity with this church. So it says here in Ephesians 4, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Right? So how do we have this unity? It says here in verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So notice the emphasis there. The way you get unity, you endeavor in unity in the spirit of peace because you have one, one, you have things in common, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, right? One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So this is how you get unity, right? And the way you get unity is you have to talk to one another. We've talked about this before. You know, if you talk to one another, your communication is really important um, in order for you to have unity in your marriage so like we talked about what can you do better in your communication in your marriage in your relationship um, and you think about what can you do better rather than having the frame of mind of oh you know i just wish my husband talked more you know my husband opened up why don't you be the first to open up you know like you be the first to open up i often tell people about this when you're trying to make friends where people will say things like, oh, you know, people don't talk about things and it's hard to make friends. And I always say to them, well, how are you making friends? Like, are you opening up? You know, if you open up first, then generally people's defenses come down and then they will open up. And it's no different in your marriage. You know, if you are more open with your spouse talking about things, 
Um, you know, you want to think of it like a service. You know, you put your pride aside, you open up, you let your guard down. You know, you need to risk being hurt in order to make a, you know, a, a deeper relationship with somebody. So you want to think of it like a service to your spouse, you know, it's, it, and, 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 you know, when you open up, that's the best way to break down barriers because often, you know, pride is really what gets in the way of people getting to a deeper, deeper communication, deeper level of understanding of each other because, you know, you're, you're worried about what they might think about you. You're worried about, you might sound silly. You know, you might, you know, be worried about, um, you know, being hurt things like that. But when it comes to your marriage, you need to risk these things, right? You need to be willing to take a risk in order to improve your marriage and get it to the next level. So have an attitude of service when it comes to conversation and communication, when you're talking with your spouse. Like it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be about you. You know, like try and talk about the things, you know, understand maybe what, in, what they enjoy, you know, what excites them and talk about that, right? Rather than saying, well, they never talk about the things I like. Well, how, like I said, when we talked about the the mentality of what can you do better you know don't just think oh our relationship sucks because he always talks about cars yeah you can't control that you know because if i was talking to him i'd say hey maybe you don't want to talk about cars so often because she doesn't want to talk about cars but when we're thinking about how we can improve our marriage what we can do if you have somebody that's always talking about cars or you have a woman that's always talking about I don't, know, I don't know what women talk about shoes right or whatever you know whatever women talk about makeup or hair or whatever um, even babies, you know, women, women like to talk about their children. They like to talk about different things. Like if, and, you know, if you know that she's passionate about those things as a husband, why don't you learn about it or get, talk about it with her? You know, you take an interest as well. Think of it like a service. Like I'm serving her in the sense that now we can have a better conversation because I can talk about the things that she likes as well, as opposed to just the things that I like. Um, you know, if they're on a bandwagon, you know, jump on it with them. You know, that's a way that you can improve, improve your marriage. Um, and pride really is, uh, you know, one of the, the worst things about a marriage. Um, it's going to hinder that communication. Um, look at what it says here in Proverbs 13, 10. Only by pride cometh contention. What's contention? It's fighting and arguing, right? So why do couples argue and fight? It's, it's always pride. But with the well-advised is wisdom. So pride is the enemy of relationship building, right? It's, it's why people fight. It's why people don't want to open up and share things. Um, you know, one thing I always say in marriages you know, don't have no go zones. That just destroys communication. You know, I, 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 so many times I, I meet couples and it's like, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, we just don't talk about that. That's a no go zone. You know, you need to get those out of your relationship. And obviously you can't change another person, right? You can't change, like if your husband or your wife has a no go zone, you have to try and cultivate that relationship where you can, you know, try and talk about those things and get on the same page again. But if you, because we're talking about how you can improve your marriage, if you have a no-go zone with your husband, you need to get rid of that no-go zone, right? That, in terms of, when I, what do I mean by no-go zones, if you're wondering what I'm talking about? No-go zones in relationships, it's, it's like topics you don't talk about, you know, topics that you always fight about, topics that, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's something and it's just like, oh, we don't want to talk about that, and it's just something that we avoid. That'll, that'll hinder your fellowship within your relationship. You know, when there are no things you can't talk about, and there's a no-go zone, think about the message that that's sending to the other person. It's like when you have a friend, even relationships in church, and there are things you can't talk about, then you start thinking, well, well what else is going to be a no-go zone? Because if I bring up something else, maybe they're going to react that way. And it's just a hindrance on having open communication. And this is what you need in a relationship. You need to be able to be honest and, and, and share with one another so that you can have unity and have a good relationship. Now, obviously, you know, how you respond as well when people open up is equally important as opening up. Because let's say somebody opens up to you and then you just call them an idiot or you say like, oh, that's so stupid or whatever. I mean, do you think they're going to open up to you again as easily the next time? You know, they say once burnt, twice shy. So not only opening up, you know, and because when you open up to somebody, you're going to think about how they responded to you. The same thing is if, if they open up to you, how are you responding? And just when I talked about that, the last point about, you know, how men think, you know, men obviously struggle with, you know, pornography. They might struggle with lustful thoughts. And, and if you as a woman just like don't get that and then he shares a struggle with you and then you just like write him off as an idiot or I mean, he's, not, he's probably not going to share with you again. You know, you need, to, you need to have some understanding and have some compassion and, and learn to see it from the other point of view. So 
just as much as opening up, it's important that we hear as well. And um, I won't go to those passages for sake of time, but we've, we've gone to them as well. We talked about misunderstanding, miscommunication, you know, having a soft answer, being swift to hear, slow to speak, you know, don't get emotional too quickly and things like that. And don't assume. Now, when I talk to people in a relationship and I, and I, I say to them, you know, you know how, how are you going to get on board and, and on the same page? Um, I tell them, you know, you really should be discussing everything, like talking about everything. Because that's how you get on, that's how you get on the same page, is if you, you know what the other person is thinking. And the only way you can understand and know what they're thinking is if you talk to them, right? And you share their thoughts. And, and how you talk, the way you talk, the, the what you talk about, the way you respond, that all leads to having a better relationship. But, you know, it's just some, I'll just rattle off some things. You know, talking about the Bible, uh, the, your goals, things you want to achieve in life, your desires, things you like, favorite foods, your concerns, if something's bothering you, um, you know, talking about the struggles that you have in life or with sin. Uh, and like I said, you know, be compassionate and understanding if they do share those things with you. You know, it's your family, whole, you know, the list goes on and on. Just, just talk about those things, you know, talk about these things with each other and, and learn to, you know, if, 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 if your husband or wife likes to talk about these things, you know, learn to listen as well. You know, you, you think about the service. How can I be a better listener? These are ways that you can improve your marriage. And if you spend time talking to one another, you know, I, I honestly believe this is like God's solution to gossip, right? Like instead of you talking about other people to other people, you know, you can talk about this with your spouse. You know, like I don't think there's a problem because obviously you're, you're one flesh, right? So, you know, you, this, this God gives you somebody that you can talk about anything to. Right. And, you, you know, you can talk about other people. Right. And talk about these things and then you won't have a need to go and tell somebody else. Right. And that's what I find in my relationship, that if I tell my wife, because it's like that sometimes when you hear something you want to tell. But then once you've told somebody, it's like you forget. That's like you, you want to have a good relationship with your wife because you want to talk to her about something and then, you know, not not feel like how, how am I trying to say this? Because sometimes you'll. Oh, you know how this happens in a relationship, right? Where you learn something and then maybe your friend calls you on the phone and then, then you'll tell them about it. And then you get home and because you've kind of already vented, then when you get home, you're not telling her about it. So if you have that relationship with your wife where it's open and you're telling them things all the time, then there's not going to be that time where you're looking at each other and she's like, you didn't tell me about that, right? You, know, you don't want that in your relationship. You want to you know, be open talking about these things um, and that's going to improve your marriage. Now, if you're going to be talking with one another, I mean, naturally that means you're going to be spending time with one another, right? So, you know, don't work too much. Don't neglect your family. Don't neglect your relationship. You need to spend time with your wife talking about things. And I find in my, my marriage as well, if, you know, because my, my wife and I have a really open relationship, we talk about things we just talk about it over the dinner table. You know, we, we've met couples where they feel like they need to go on some special date away from their kids in order to talk about serious things. And, it, and I just think, well, why, why can't you just, I mean, you, you sleep together in the same bed. Like, just, just have the bed talk and just talk to one another. Like, you know, like talk about it over the kitchen table. Talk about it over dinner. T teach your children to, to be quiet, you know, so that when you're talking, you know, they can see how a relationship should be. Like, I don't believe in, you know, having, you know, all, all of the relationship talks and having intimate talks with your wife, like away from your children, because how, th this is one way they learn these things, right? They see how mommy and daddy interact, how they talk to one another, how they deal with one another, and that's where they're going to emulate it, right? So that they, they get this, this, um, this, this first-hand lesson. I remember seeing this, uh, this news report once, and I don't know if this is completely off topic, but I remember seeing this, this news show and they were asking the question like, do you, do you shower with your children? Like, do you let your children see you naked? And uh, they, obviously people have difference of opinions, but um, I, I don't think there's a problem. I, I, you know, I shower with my children. You know, obviously there's going to come an age where I don't shower with Sarah anymore, but like I do shower with Sarah. You know, I, shower, I, I wash them and, uh, and all those sorts of things. Um, and I, I actually don't have a problem with my kids seeing me naked. Right? And, and you know, my wife has more of a problem with her kids seeing her naked. And obviously, Simon's getting to the age now where we 
uh, I have to start sort of like, you know, not letting him see things and things, things like that. But when they're, when they're really young, I feel like, hey, this is a way that they can get their first biology lesson, right? Without having to look at pornographic images and images of other people, right? This is a way you can teach them within the family, you know, they can understand these things early on and it's not, they're not having all these sexual thoughts and things like that. Um, I honestly don't have, have a problem with that. But, you know, in my family, things are really open and, and honest and things like that. So I don't think you need to, if you have that sort of relationship where you're spending time with your wife, uh, you know, you don't need to have these special dates where you go and talk about serious things. You can just talk in the bed, you can talk uh, over the dinner table. Um, and if you have a relationship like that, you're not bottling up emotions as well. So you're not bottling up things. And then when you have that talk, you know, when, you, when you've got things bottled up, it's a lot harder to talk with a, you know, a sort of calmer demeanor. Now, the last thing I just want to talk about, I won't spend too much time here, is uh, just overcoming conflicts and challenges. Because really, it, it really is tied in uh, with uh, communication. Uh, we'll go here to Ephesians 4, verse 25. It says here, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So obviously when you are going to have open and honest and proactive communication with your spouse, you're going to come across conflict, aren't you? And how you deal with that conflict. The, the only point I really want to make on this point is don't let, um, don't let conflict and challenges fester. You know, the Bible says here, be angry and sin, sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And what is this referring to? It's saying, hey, you, sh you ought to deal with that problem as soon as it happens. And, you know, you, we talk, and, and when you have a relationship with somebody, conflict is inevitable. And the easiest thing to do, we talked about at the beginning, oh, if only they just did something different, right? Or, you know, maybe you might have the temptation to just go, you know what, we just, we just not talk about it. No go zone, right? We just won't talk about that thing again. You know, my, my honest belief is if you want a good relationship, that is a really bad way to go about it. And, and it's so tempting because I've done it before as well. I'm not saying I'm perfect, right? I've done it before as well when you have a bit of a beef, a bit of a beef and you're just like, you know what? Oh, I, just, I just don't want to deal with this, right? But sometimes conflict in a marriage, it's a bit like dirty dishes. You know, dirty dishes is, you know, if you leave them in the sink, sometimes it's just easier just to, to clean it straight away, right? In, in, in the kitchen, you guys know, but if you leave them there and they start getting really hard and baked on, that's what I feel like re uh, conflicts in a relationship is like, just harder to clean it off later. And it's a bit like exercise, you know, if you just do it, like, you, you know, you've had it, that issue with your wife, you know, if you just, like I said, what can you do better if you just go, and make up and apologize for what you did, try and talk about it, make it right. It's going to be so much easier to do it, you know, like just right after it happens or maybe a day later, you know, it's just like really, let's say, you know, you, you didn't get to deal with it that day, you did it the next day, because obviously you should do it the same day, right? Because the Bible's saying, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. If something happens, you should do it before you even go to bed. But, you know, if you don't get that opportunity, do it as soon as possible because once it goes further and further and further, it's just harder and harder to deal with that. So, like I said, just, just sort of wrapping this up here, I won't talk too much more about that point. But the whole point of this sermon here, and I, I hope you sort of gathered it from the beginning, is if you want to improve your marriage, you need to think about what you can do better, right? Because it's so, much easy, it's so easy to just say, oh, they should do this. They can do this better. They should come to me to make up, right? But you can't control what other people do. And if you have that frame of mind in your marriage, your marriage is not going to get better. But if you have the frame of mind of service, what can I do better? I look at these commandments in the Bible. You know, we went to Ephesians 5. We went to 1 Corinthians 7. You know, we went to these different passages in Ephesians in terms of communication and whatnot. And instead of thinking, oh, you know, my husband or my wife was just a better husband or wife. You know, they were a better communicator. They, you know, when they did something wrong, they came to me. If you just internalize and say, hey, you know, I can only control what I do. I have a responsibility to be the best Christian I can be. And I guarantee you, if you grow in your faith, you grow in the sort of husband and wife you are, you will have a positive effect on your husband. And he will probably end up being a better husband. Your wife will probably end up being a more submissive wife. Why? Because you are growing 
as a Christian and getting better and doing what you can control, right? Rather than putting the onus on the other person. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, um, for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, that you're the ultimate example of, um, you know, you came for us. You know, we, you, we love you because you first loved us. So we pray, Lord, that, that this mind in you would also be in us, that we would be a servant. And uh, Lord, we would apply this to our marriage so that we would have strong marriages and we can raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that, you know, so much information in this sermon, but I just pray, Lord, that um, people would um, really internalize, you know, that they would take responsibility for their marriage, that they would consider uh, what they can do better before considering what the other person should do. And uh, Lord, if we have that focus, I'm sure we would have much stronger relationships and marriages in this church. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us with that. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect, Lord. So give us the grace, Lord, to do what's right. Give us the grace to do 100%, even if we're receiving 0%, just as you did on the cross. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.